Hey guys, uh, today we've got myself, Craig Soule, we've got Mike Hammett out of Chicago, Chi-Town, uh, Thomas Kernick out of Slovakia, and over here is Tom Smith, and we're going to be talking about Unimus. Did I say that right? Yes. Ooh, Unimus. There you go. I always want to say Unimus, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's Unimus. Unimus. <laughs> this is Thomas's personal project. Uh, I think it was a pet project for a little while, born out of necessity as so many things are, and then um, he just kept molding it and sculpting it into a finished product and now he's in uh, a live beta correct yes it's a closed beta for now but uh, it's actually been live for uh four four days until yeah four days ago we we sent out a massive massive invite so excellent so unimus is a backup system Right. Uh, very flexible. You wrote it in Java, correct? Yes, it's actually written entirely in Java. And uh, yeah, it's a backup uh, solution and also a config management, config change management solution. All right. So I know uh, Thomas is probably the, the biggest Microtech guy I know, uh, honestly. So it uh, right out of the box, it's going to do Microtech backups. And so I'm always hearing people ask, you know, what are you using for Microtech backups? And I wrote the ugliest, dirtiest script that barely works um, so now I'll finally have an answer to that question hey check out this Unimus stuff I know you're still working out some of the details some of the pricing and some of the flism and flosm and you've got a couple of flavors you've got uh, cloud hosted so people can just have it run off net uh, which is probably going to be what I'm going to look at doing <laughs> for some of it uh, once you get that flavor up and running but then also you have the private option where you pay one time and you get it for life and that's just kind of the introduction right so I love to hear uh, Thomas talk a little bit more about it so so how did you where did the idea first come from well in in all of my networks uh, <laughs> I've looked at getting some backup solutions running and uh, I don't know if you guys have experience with any of the existing backup solutions that there are for not just Microtik, but for network equipment in, in general. And uh, basically, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare to set up, it's a nightmare to maintain, it's a nightmare to run. And uh, <laughs> I figured if, if it took me days to, to have something even half workable, that, that, then that's just not acceptable. And uh, so I decided to write a system that you can actually have fully running and backing up your entire infrastructure in, in about five minutes. That's pretty awesome. So what are some of the old systems you guys have used? I've used uh, NCM made by SolarWinds, Network Configuration Manager, I think, and it runs like poo. It's so resource intensive and it just starts bogging down over time. Um, I've used Rancid before uh, to do sort of Cisco backs up, and I guess that, that Cisco backups. That does sort of a CVS subversion sort of thing where you can do um, uh, diffs on your code to see, you know, kind of what changed here and there. But it's it's pretty clunky and um, there's no microtech out of the box. I've seen where there's a couple of scripts where you can kind of kind of kludge it together. And I think people have gotten it working. Um, what have you guys tried? It, uh, most of mine has basically been manual. Um, Libre uh, NMS that I've got running at the exchange. Um, it, uh, I forgot what it was it had. Um, I ended up not getting it working yet. Um, it, it was an alternative to Rancid. It added some Git or something like that functionality to it. And of course, I can't remember what it's called. You're useless, Mike. Tom, what oxidize. Are you... <laughs> oxidize is what it was called. We, we, we what are you doing, Tom? Um, years ago, we used to use P-Link with, like, believe it or not, uh, scheduler scripts. So Microsoft, like, and using Putty, the P-Link command, and actually sending a command in to export the config and then doing a copy of the config down with another command and, and obviously repeating that ad nauseum. We hadn't integrated it with any first in control system or anything like that. So it was a very kind of basic, just backup, no versioning. Um, we've played around with Rancid a little bit, but I suppose we've kind of just moved on with other projects that are kind of just 
fell by the wayside. I suppose because we have a quite a small team as well. Uh, change management um, wasn't at the forefront of our agenda where you know you have a lot of people working on various systems concurrently. So um, because we have a kind of small tight knit team, we've kind of we haven't had that same requirement. But uh, I haven't said that by in discussing Unimus with the lads or Unimus with the lads in the office, they're actually quite uh, quite excited about it. Um, uh, the prospects that uh, some of the stuff that Tom was alluding to, the features that it would have going forward. So the lads were like, geez, this could be a, a big game changer because the network has evolved and expanded and the team here has expanded as well. So it's, it's more interesting for us now. Yeah. So, so I know my, uh, my ugly script that I wrote a million years ago that runs on Windows does that exact thing that you're talking about. It, it kicks off P-Link. You just schedule it to run every night and then it calls P-Link and, and goes and does the ugly and sticks the text files in a folder based on month, right? So it's the most basic of basic, doing exactly what you did, right? Um, and that's sort of worked. I mean, it, it does work, right? But there's no, um, there's no checking, right? So if it does fail the backup, we have no, we have no visibility into that. We just have a schedule on our calendar every month to go, hey, check the backups and make sure it looks like they're all running. You know, make sure that there's like 4K in every file. And I know that's it's not expandable and it's, you know, it's not a good indication all the time that things are working right. And say we make a major change today and it breaks and I don't know about it for a month, that's not going to do me any good. So we definitely needed something real, something feature rich, um, something that's easy to get off the ground. And from everything I've seen on Unimus so far, that's where it's at. So I know we've been kind of talking it up a lot, and I think uh, Thomas should just kind of give us the, the quick and dirty on it. So we talked about the history. He needed a system. He put it together quickly, and it just kept evolving and growing from there. Tell us some of the benefits of it. Some of the, maybe some of the, what led you to, to create some of the features and some of the pitfalls you've run into. Because is this your, would you say this is your first major software project you've ever developed and released out, Thomas? Well, uh, so for the first part, uh, like you guys all said, that's pretty much the the problems or the solutions that I've seen most of the people implement, right? We have some custom scripts or we have some schedules or we don't have nothing or we've looked at Rancid, but it's hard to set up. Or And uh, Rancid and Oxidized, which is exactly what I've been using before, uh, first thing they do is they require you to know a C, uh, you know, code versioning system which a lot of networking guys don't know. Like you, you say Git and, and people don't know how Git works. And let's be honest, Git is not the easiest thing in the world and many networking people don't need it, right? And uh, of course, many do, but many don't. And uh, yeah, also, like you said, there are, you know, you wrote your custom implementation for Microtik and somebody has a script for that and somebody has a script for the other vendor, but your network is never going to be Microtik only. Right, so that's another thing that that motivated Unimus. It's to have all of the network vendors and all of your devices inside of a single software. That you know, all of your backups organized in a single place, notifications of, of failure, and, and all that just organic workflow in a single software with change management, with with actually seeing how your config evolves over time, because that can be really useful for for many reasons, right? And just yeah, to have it running in five minutes, that's a huge difference to, to system like Rancid or Oxidize that take that take days to set up. And you already have to have a lot of knowledge to even set them up in those days. So. And exactly what you're talking about. It's got a million features, but network, network engineers, we only need like three of those basic features, right? And so with all that complexity, it's a big turnoff, which is why I know so many people who don't do it because it's such a pain in the butt. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's that's what I try to solve with Unimus. It's just, you know, 10 clicks and have backups, and that's it. And then two more clicks and have differentials, and, and you are able to do config, you know, change management and, and stuff like that. And so that, that was the whole goal of the project. That's tremendous. That's tremendous. So was this your first software development project that you've ever really undertaken and released? So I've written quite a bit of software, 
from automation scripts through Puppet Manifest, through Autoit, a lot of Autoit integration with things, and uh, some basic websites like an internal radius management system and stuff like that. But yeah, this is actually my first major software project that I've spent half a year just writing code pretty much. And uh, yeah, so far it's been it's been actually great fun. <laughs> it was a nice change of, of you know. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah, very very often. No, not very often. Every so often, I'll end up having to to write a program or a really intensive script or something like that to perform a task. Nothing on the the grand scale of this, but it is nice to make your brain kind of shift gears and think in a completely different way. And. Uh, you can sort of turn off and then just you look up and three hours have passed and you know you have another couple hundred lines of code it's pretty tremendous so tell us how the unimus system works if if we've reached that point actually at this point it will be easier to to show you <laughs> ah even better i'm such a visual <laughs> learner <laughs> so just give me a second to set it up here so i can connect from my laptop okay so this is how Unimus looks when you deploy it for the completely first time. Uh, so for deployment, like we mentioned, it's actually based on Java, so it works on absolutely any operating system which runs Java, which is everything these days. And you can actually deploy it uh, uh, also into Java application servers like Tomcat or JBoss or, or similar. Uh, so you can actually deploy it there, or you can just download a... Uh, executable file which works on Windows or Linux and uh, actually right now I am working on some proper installers uh, so it would actually set up your Windows service or, or a Debian package which would, which would install everything so that's also uh, being worked on but uh, yeah right now you just deploy it into Tomcat or you just double click on an executable and it runs so it has a web interface of course um, it's fully responsive, so if you want, you can actually set it up on your tablet. I don't know anybody who manages their network from their tablet, but, you know. Uh, okay, or so, maybe pop up from your smartphone, something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it can be useful for that, so if you just want to really fast check up on something, you can. Uh, anyway. Really quick, so for, the, the, for the guys that... Um, that are just listening to the podcast, paint them a picture with words, kind of what are we seeing visually? <laughs> so the first thing we need to do is just create the username and password, right, to, to access the system in the future. So the first thing after the deployment is we get to the configuration wizard and we will just create a username and password. And the, the initial configuration wizard is just a screen asking for a username and password and repeat the password. It's super simple. Yeah, then you just press continue setup and it will ask you for, for a database. So uh, if you don't want to even deal with the database, you can just click continue and it will, it will pretty much work. Uh, other than you have to give, write an encryption key, but we'll get to that one later. So you can either use a local file-based database or you can use MySQL or PostgreSQL or any other database engines that, that you want. So for this demo, we'll just not bother with the database and use a file-based database. And, Sorry, Tom, for your talk to you. Have you any... Uh, preference on that, like as the author of this program, uh, like have you a preference on database or database engine? Uh, uh, so application that's, like that's another advantage of Java that actually uh, the database is handled by the framework which I use on the background, which is Hibernate. So actually, the software it completely doesn't matter what database you use because uh, from the software point of view, it it's accessing all of them equally. So uh, no real preference. So performance-wise, uh, how many how many microticks or, or I guess just in devices are you backing up on a regular basis? And do you think it would run, say, smoothly with a 1,000 devices on file-based? Or at, at what point do you really feel like you should switch to a database? So it depends a lot on, on how you configure Unimus because in a couple of uh, screens we will have a schedule configuration. So for example, if you are backing uh, a thousand devices once an hour, you will definitely want a, a proper database system. But Thomas, I think we lost your audio, brother. Sorry? We lost your audio for a second there. That was weird. Oh, okay. So, uh, so if you are just backing up uh, 100 devices once a night at 3 a.m. or something, then file-based is completely, completely enough. 
And I guess to back up the backup, all you'd have to do is just copy that flat file off somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. Or you can actually run two Onimus servers and they will back up all of your devices from, you know, completely separate VMs or however you are deploying Onimus. So uh, the one thing we actually need to type on the screen is the encryption key. Uh, and this is because Unimus already internally encrypts all of the data going into the database. So uh, it actually uses AES-128. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, so none of the data inside the database is in clear text, like your backups, usernames, passwords, and, and similar things. And that's yeah. actually another feature which I think is really important because if you look at other softwares, uh, I don't know why, but software never deals with encryption and always just leaves it to the database layer. You know, you should encrypt in your database. But normal networking people will not be able to do that or will not want to spend the time to set up a proper database encryption solution. Right? Gotcha. So this software puts the training wheels on to help. That's yeah, yeah. You just, so. you just type in an encryption password and it's already taken care of you, right? You don't have to deal with all of the complexities of encrypting the database and stuff like that. It encrypts it on the software layer and then you just know your database is safe, which I feel is a big point because if you look even on big uh, solutions like Radius, and this is a really big issue that I have with radi free radius, for example, right? If you need to do a PAP authentication, then you need to have a clear text password in the database. And that's a really big concern, right? And uh, so, yeah, kind of going on, uh, on a tangent there. But uh, basically, that's why the Unimus already handles it in the application logic, so you don't have to deal with anything, and you know your data is already encrypted and safe inside of the database. Gotcha. And so for the folks that can't see the screen, he's actually on the left. He's got a nice uh, set of instructions that go along with it. They kind of explain what the encryption <coughs> key is, the uh, encryption level, and at what levels you should actually switch to or think about using a database. It's tremendous. Yes. So yeah, like like I mentioned, the the whole application is written so that anybody can deploy it and configure it in in five minutes tops. That was the goal from from the beginning. So actually, every screen explains just the right amount of information that you need to know for to complete that particular uh, part of of the configuration wizard. Gotcha. So it's basically a TLDR <laughs> for any of yeah, us that exactly. just want to get exactly. going fast. Yeah, just just enough so so you can continue and so it's set up properly. So I'll just type in an encryption password. Uh, is and there any constraints on the key? Minimums, maximums? Uh, so the key is actually used to generate 120-bit uh, IVs for the IES encryption. So there are actually no constraints, but of course the uh, longer and more complex you make it, the better the actual, you know, better the uh, randomness of the IP, the initialization vector of the encryption. So theoretically, the the better the key, the stronger the encryption, right? Okay, yeah, the, I was I was trying to use LastPass to generate 100 or 128 character random passwords for things, and constantly get frustrated by things that have you know, 12 or 20 character maximums. I actually made specifically because of you sure that all other passwords inside of the application support up to 512 characters. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. I'll just click continue setup, right? And the next screen we have here is uh, to input our uh, credentials that we use in our network to access our devices. So how Unimus actually works is that it's completely automatic and later on when we will be adding devices, you just give it an IP address and everything else is, is completely automatic. So you need to give Unimus, of course, some kind of credentials to, to access your devices in your network so it can back them up. And uh, you can actually uh, put in as many credentials as you want here, and Unimus will automatically find out which credentials are valid for which device and remember that and use those uh, later on. So when you are creating devices, you don't actually have to put in credentials for every device or something similar. You just configure your credentials, and it takes care of, of figuring out which should be used there and how. That's awesome. So say, for example, I'm a network operator and I do consulting for somebody just just theoretically right and so I wanted to back up my customers devices 
do you think maybe in the future there's going to be a way where I can say this set of credentials would be for, say, this this group of devices, these sets of users? Or or would you recommend that I just spin up a new instance of this for those other customers? Oh, yeah, definitely. Just spin up a new instance in their topology. That would be the best. So their backups are locally kept in, in their infrastructure and et cetera. Gotcha. Yeah, what do they call that? Like multi-tenant? I didn't know if you had plans for that or not in this. Uh, so... Um, not currently, because as I said, prefer preferably you would want to deploy an instance of Unimus in, in your customer's infrastructure. And actually, again, one of the advantages of Java is that you can run this on Raspberry Pis or any of the other micro computers or single board computers that you want. And uh, actually, that's uh, that's what what I really like deploying. You know, just Raspberry Pi, which is like. Uh, uh, 40 bucks and then you have a fully functional backup solution in your network so yeah I, I would recommend just if, if nothing else put it on a raspberry pi and put it inside of the customer's uh, infrastructure and, and there you go just a really big thumb drive in it yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so I'll just type in a bunch of credentials uh, so I have multiple here because I want to show you guys uh, multiple devices uh, scattered all over the place. So the next step is just to configure ports which are used in your network. And uh, you can actually put multiple ports in here. So if you are even running some devices SSH on 22 and some devices on 28 or something else, you can actually configure uh, different port groups, so to speak. So for us, we'll just leave this on default and, and just so on this page, on this page uh, for you guys that are just listening, he's got uh, all the different protocols and the protocol ports that you can just change to any non-default if you want. Uh, so yeah, it's actually just SSH, HTTP, and HTTPS. Right. Yeah, I was so, talking to Thomas the other day about Telnet, and he said, yeah, it's not going to do Telnet. No, 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 it's not going to do Telnet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next screen is to create schedules. Um, Unimus will, of course, back up your devices according to schedules, so you can create uh, whatever kind of schedules you want. There is one created for free AM every night already. So again, if, if you are happy with that, you just click continue. If not, you can create as many different schedules as, as you like. Uh, there is a little screen which you can select monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, and then just configure all of the appropriate uh, uh, appropriate settings. Gotcha. So when it runs to actually back up the devices, does it just blast and do them all at once, or does it do just five at a time and then just work its way down the list? Or how does it actually do that? So it's actually uh, automat auto scaling. So there is an internal uh, thread pool uh, for discoveries and for backups, and uh, all of the devices are put into the thread pool into a queue, you could say, and then the thread pool picks up uh, a task from the queue up to the number of allowed threads in the pool. So it actually does it concurrently up to a certain point and then works through that queue. No, 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 actually, yeah, it will sort of pace itself. And uh, I am in one of the near future versions, there will actually be a monitoring API where you can actually find out if, uh, you know, the internal health of the application and the thread pool usage, and if uh, it's actually managing to do all of the backups that, that you are giving it to do and stuff like that. Again, it's actually auto-scaling. So uh, theoretically, as long as your uh, machine or the virtual machine or, or Raspberry Pi has enough resources, so enough CPU and enough RAM, it, it will handle as many devices as you give it. I love that I haven't came up with a question that caught you off guard yet. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, well, you know, I, I happen to know all of the internals since I wrote them, so... <laughs> gotcha. So this screen that we're looking at right now is basically a basic schedule setup. It's got a default one in there and you can add or remove um, or mm -hmm. it looks like choose to make a different one default if you like. Yeah, so so how it actually works is if you already have a default schedule even later on and you are using that default schedule for, I don't know, 200 devices and then you create a different schedule and mark it as the new default, it will actually properly reschedule all of those devices to the new default schedule and stuff like that. So 
the default schedule is not like you know this schedule will be hard set for every device rather every device uses the default the schedule that's currently marked as default so if you mark a different one as the default one then all of the devices will be backed up you know rescheduled and and all that so in your network what kind of scheduling do you do are you doing more recent or more regular than just 3 a.m once a day or are you doing it just once a day 3 a.m okay I was trying to think of a scenario where you'd want to back up really frequently some specific device. Well, maybe if in a lab you are doing a lot of labbing and a lot of changes and you want to back up, I don't know, every five minutes just so if you if you screw something up, you have those recovery points in the past. And also maybe because you, you want to have the, that, you know, change uh, differential so you can see all the changes every five minutes that you are doing or, or something like that. You could easily just set that up and... Or if they could say you have a couple of uh, gateway routers where people maybe make a change or two twice a day, then having it more regularly uh, scheduled could make a lot of sense then. So if somebody completely bricks the router at, you know, three in the afternoon and all the changes from the, you know, that were made during the day aren't lost, I guess that kind of makes sense. Oh, it it depends on your use case, right? So you can configure it as as you require. So now we if we actually do finish setup, then we just insert the license key and uh, we just press finish. So what happens right now actually is that <laughs> Unimus has already synchronized all of my devices from my account uh, into this deployment. So how it's handled on the backend is that your license key actually binds your addresses to it. And that is why I mentioned you can really easily have uh, like a backup of a backup or a highly available backup system. Because it, if you add a device uh, onto your license key, it will automatically synchronize it to your other deployments with this license key. Very awesome. So if you had a server completely brick, and you reinstalled on a new machine, put your license in, then it's going to go and pull all those devices you're already backing up? Yes, yeah, just the device addresses, nothing else. Gotcha. So you still have to enter all the credentials. Only, uh, only addresses are actually synchronized to the license key, nothing else. No credentials, no schedules, no backups, nothing else, just the addresses themselves. And this is, again, simply to make it easy to, to deploy Unimus uh, in, in multiple servers. So when you add an address to one server, you know, if you have three servers because you are really paranoid and, and you really want to have that high availability, some breaks, you have the backup, you don't have to manually add that address into every single one of those three servers. You just add it into the one and it will synchronize through the licensing system automatically to the others. That's beyond clever. <laughs> That's really cool. I like that a lot. And even then, you could have one server that hits one schedule, um, and then you have your other, you know, your backup to the backup that's running, say, an hour later. That way, you know you're yes, not exactly. accessing both of those devices simultaneously. That, you know, so that's that's actually really cool. And again, for from the security standpoint, you are not actually leaking any of the information to to me because obviously you wouldn't want your credentials or your backups or anything else uh, going to me, right? So that's why the only thing that's actually synchronized is is the addresses of your back devices you are backing up. Very cool, very cool. So right now, after we entered the license key in, it's popped us in. I guess we're in the the main dashboard screen. Mm -hmm. So you can see kind of a main application statistics here on the dashboard and then a log of, of your successful and unsu unsuccessful tasks. So you can actually see that we have a bunch of discoveries which happen cor uh, correctly. There's some Ubiquiti, some Cisco, some HP, Microtik, and then we have two devices which did not uh, discover properly. Very cool. And what happens if you click the info button there? Oh, it show. just tells you why so for example this one is ssh timeout and this one is ssh timeout as well very nice so if there is a failure it gives you a nice yeah it will tell you like uh, no credentials were valid for this device or uh, unable unknown device unable to discover device and uh, or ssa connection fail etc very clean yeah so it's for for the guys that are just listening it's a super simple uh dashboard screen that gives you latest successful jobs gives you a nice 
list, right? Everything's sorted in there. And then latest failed jobs, uh, current running jobs. So it's showing you everything that's happening right now. And then current session statistics. It's basically everything you want to know right there in one tiny little interface. So if you go into devices, right, you can see what kind of devices I currently have added into Unimus. So again, this is because uh, it's synchronized from my license key that I entered in the wizard. And uh, basically, you can see most of the stuff that, that we support here in this list, right? So there's some Cisco switches and routers, HP switches, MicroTIG routers, Ubiquiti Edge switch, and our Natonix switch is actually offline right now. How long does it take you to integrate a new device? So say uh, we about about. Uh, it depends on the complexity of the interaction with the device, <laughs> but anywhere from like one to four hours. Got you. So, wow, that's and that, that's one time. So that's not something a user has to go and, and no, 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 all no. this it's, stuff. That's it's automatically again. That's that's the convenience of a system like this. You just deploy it, and it supports Cisco, Microtik, HP, Ubiquiti, Netonix, uh, whatever else. Gotcha. And so that's one of the things I hate about like a rancid system. If I come up with a new uh, device and it's not already built in. I've got to go out. I've got to start researching. I've got to try and figure out. I've got to do all this work to see if I can get it integrated with Unimus. If there's a new device, uh, I'm assuming we just send a ticket of support, make that available to you, and then you work it out integration. And then that work you did there gets filtered out to everybody else, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And like my aim really is to support everything that's out there. Uh, again, because of how Unimus is built on the backend and how I've organized basically all of the discovery and backup modules and stuff like that, as I said, it's really easy and and quite fast to integrate support for, for any device, really. So uh, hopefully by the time you get Unimus, it will actually already support all of the devices you have. And if not, like you said, it's it's just a couple of hours to actually add support for, for any vendor, any kind of a device. That's awesome. That's awesome. So this, this screen, uh, I know you guys that are, that are listening, which I think is probably most of them. I don't know how many of them stare at our ugly faces on a regular basis, but uh, this is a devices screen and it shows you everything that's already in there. He's got uh, a nice list. It shows you the vendor, the type of device it is. It looks like the, the make and model over there. Um, and it looks as if the, the list is searchable. Yes. So there is a search filter. You can search through them and uh, yeah. You can also manually run a backup. So if I select all of the devices and click backup now, it will actually uh, backup all of them. So you can see it backed up all of my devices that it knows. And for the ones that it doesn't know, it attempts a discovery, right? And that's sick. For you guys that can't see, on this, this list, you can see all the addresses. As soon as he hit backup now on it, uh, it immediately popped to the right of the device. What phase of backup it's in, right? So some of them were discovering. So like you said, it was looking for different credentials or it was actively backing up. And so you can see live information on each one of those devices, what's happening in real time, which is tremendous. None of my other systems do that. Uh, so you're kind of blowing my mind right now. And as you saw, actually, it took just like five or six seconds to, to back up all of those 10 devices that we have here currently. So it's nice and snappy. That's tremendous. That, uh, and then, uh, you know, on the topic of, uh, you know, adding new platforms, um, I believe today uh, you added uh, two different Cisco platforms and Netonix. You just yeah, found yeah, those out yeah. today um, at our request. Uh, again, if anybody has a request for a device to add in, just let me know. I will be completely happy to, to add whatever kind of a device you, you want me to add. I think it's a nice symbiotic relationship. It benefits the software and it benefits you as well. So if anybody has some kind of a device they would like support it, just let me know and, and we'll make it happen. That's something I definitely enjoy when a, when a provider will take the time to, yeah, oh, I'll integrate this for you, but then it also gets pushed out back to the rest of the community. Because I've seen some software manufacturers, well, they'll, they'll do custom stuff but it stays just with you, right? They don't push it back out to, to benefit their entire community, which drives me crazy. So we've seen how the system works. Let's check out some of the backups if we can. So I'll just make another one. Uh, actually, I'll just make some changes to a Mikrotik so I can show you the diff system. 
Okay, so I made some changes to one of my micro ticks, which is actually this one. So I'll just back it up again to, to have a backup. Okay, it's done <laughs> before I could be, before I could even finish the sentence. <laughs> so if we go into backups now, right? You can see again there's there's two tables. So you have the device table with the search and everything else, and then you have backups table. So as soon as you click on any device, right, you can you can actually see the backups and you just select the backup and, and press download and, and the, there you have it. So for, for a more interesting feature, of course, it's it's the differential. So if I select any two backups and do a differential, then I will actually get a nice diff that's telling me, you know, what changed on this device. And uh, yeah. Okay. So for those folks that are just listening, uh, he chose his microtech that he made a change in, and it showed all of the backups right there in the list. He just selected the last two and hit the diff button, and immediately it pops up the output, and it's got colored... Uh, highlighted additions, deletions, things like that. So again, this is useful for the change management and change auditing mainly, right? So if you want to see the changes that have been made to your device in the last week, it's it's just a couple of clicks, literally. Gotcha. So you could say beginning of the week, this one, uh, today, this one, show me everything that changed in between the two. Oh yeah, yeah, and it would give you a, a list of all of the changes. And again, it's it's very useful for change management and for auditing as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a, then, uh, then one could take this, uh, you know, these backups and they could look at their NMS solution and see, oh, Syslog has Bob and Jim logged in between this backup and this back. So one of those two guys is the one that screwed it up. <laughs> Mike wants to blame people. That's what he's looking for. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, you have the diff showing you what changed, and then you see who who are the possible changers. For sure. Um, you, know, you could attempt to uh, find the cause of your, of your network woes. For sure. So let me think. Uh, that's... I mean, well, I don't want to jump ahead of the gun because uh, I have some questions for you at the end. Kind of, hey, is it going to do this? Hey, will it do this? So is there any other major features? I mean, you just showed us that, golly, I think the entire process probably took a good five minutes to set up. And then, well, between the time you installed and ran your first backup, it was probably five minutes. And most of that was just me jacking my jaws. So this actually is an just an extremely fast system to put together. But what what else do you have in here that you'd like to highlight, if there is anything else? So, yeah, like, uh, of course, you can reconfigure all of the things that we configured, and it would automatically change and stuff like that. But uh, one of the things I want to highlight, it's the notification system, right? So you can configure your email, or you can configure pushover. And again, it's made as simple as possible. You just type in the stuff that you need and click Save. And uh, this is actually currently uh, not implemented yet, but in uh, the hopefully next release or the release after that, uh, it will actually properly notify you when a backup fails or a discovery fails. And there will be a complete configuration, so you can actually configure it to, to notify you only if a backup fails uh, or, or notify you every time you add a device and it cannot be discovered and stuff like that. <laughs> Which I think is also an important feature to have, right? Because you want to know if if, if you don't have your backups working. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, for people that are audited, that's something that um, auditors have asked us before, right? At the data center, they say, uh, you know, are you backing everything up? Okay, well, prove it to me. You know, show me in a log that you have successes or show me, you know, any failures that you may have had. And, and so the system will reach out and, and tell you all that information immediately. So, yeah. If, if you want to see uh, your failures, you know, we just open the log and you can see everything in the log. Uh, and then, again, if uh, the notifications are there so you don't even have to access the system. Because ideally, you would deploy Unimus and you would not know about it until something either fails or until you need to do an audit or, or something else happens. So, again... For, for your own comfort, you know, your job is not to check up on Unimus if it's doing backups or not. It, it should notify you. It should let you know if there is a problem. So that's why the, the notifications are very important. It, 
it, uh, can it do like a like a heartbeat notification of once a day or once a some time period say, hey, this is what happened. Just so you know, I'm still alive. I didn't. Oh, die. like a report. Yeah. Uh, no, not currently. <laughs> but uh, post a feature request and uh, we'll make it happen. Oh yeah. Excellent. So you do have a set of forums already set up. Yes, there are forums which uh, anybody can get to. It's at forum.unimus.net, and uh, yeah, there's uh, there's tutorials and how tos. There is also some discussion. Uh, yeah, known issues list, of course, since it's still beta, and uh, feature requests and other things. Okay. So logging into the system, can you have more than one administrator set of credentials, or is it just one right now? Not yet. Not yet, but it's definitely on the to-do list. Absolutely. But at least there is at least a, an admin set of credentials where you log in and authenticate in some way. Perfection. So how do you feel about making this web accessible? Would you recommend people leave this open to the internet? So I really would recommend not, but it's not a case of Unimus, right? None of your management systems like this should be web accessible. Absolutely. So anything that we do that's monitoring, we do an air gap. So if somebody wants to see their graphs, uh, we will take their graphs, export it to something on the DMZ that they can look at, right? So uh, absolutely. I was just curious where you were going to go with that. Uh, to, I mean, I have seen some people that, that make their systems web accessible, and I guess, you know, why why expose yourself to additional risks, right? So even if your software is 100% hardened and it's running great, what happens if uh, the web server you happen to be running has a vulnerability? You know, the, the Tomcat version, you're, you, you know, there's a zero-day exploit on it and they can get into your system. Was it really worth the convenience of, of having that open to the Internet, in, in my opinion? So maybe one last thing before we can move on. Uh, so... Currently, the the one uh, not very user friendly feature is that there is no way to massively add devices into Unimus or to import from a different system. So actually, that's the feature that I am working actively on right now. So hopefully, again in the next release or or the release after that, there will also be a possibility to import devices. So you just paste in a list of IP addresses, and it will just work. Or you give it a CSV file with IP addresses and descriptions, and it will import. And uh, two other things that I really want to do is automatic synchronization with NetXMS or with Zabbix. Gotcha. So I know you had, at least when you were running this on your own system, a method for NetXMS to kind of push those devices over, right? Or, or uh, Unimus would discover them from your NetXMS install? Yeah, so how it will actually work, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, in my internal version, I had this working previously, but uh, uh, that was not quite production ready. <laughs> uh, so I am actually right now integrating it to be properly releasable to the public. And how it will work is that you just type in an IP address of your NetXMS server, your username, your password, of course, and then a filter which filters out which devices should be synchronized into Unimus from NetXMS. And again, the same for Zabbix. And uh, it will automatically synchronize. You can set, you know, every one hour, every one day, etc. And it will just pull devices into itself from your NMS solution. So ideally, if you have it properly set up with NetXMS or with Zabbix, you don't even have to log into Unimus when you when you add a new device into your NMS. It will be automatically backed up in Unimus. Okay. So one other thing while we're still on the screen, you said you have pushover settings. I have no idea what that means. Uh, pushover is a push notification uh, system or solution, I would say, where it pushes notifications to your Android or uh, Apple or desktop clients. And uh, I, I've really grown to love it over the last couple of years. And uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's pretty much just uh, check a checkbox, put your pushover delivery key in there, and you will get all the notifications from Onimus in, into your pushover. Very cool, man. Very cool. I even like your color scheme. Purple's a good color. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, man. It's a power color. So what, um, 
What other features on the horizon for this product are you kind of excited about? Oh, there's there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, th there's a lot. Uh, also, there is a uh, there is a to do list on on the forums actually, which uh, which a lot of the features that I am excited about, which I want to do before uh, before we actually release from beta to to actual you know <laughs> release. Uh, so definitely all the notifications. I, I I really think that's essentials and and a key for for Unimus to just tell you when something is wrong and and when it doesn't tell you you know that you have nothing to worry about right gotcha. so i remember and, you talking about uh on the licensing scheme uh, i know you haven't worked out how much you're going to charge for all that stuff yet uh, but you were saying something about you would have two or three devices free forever something like that oh yes so uh three devices are free forever so just when you create an account you will get free devices right away, free, and, and you can do whatever you want with those. Again, this is simply so your normal home users, which just have a router or maybe a router and an access point, uh, it doesn't make sense for them to pay for to, to just back up that. So so free devices are completely free, and uh, on top of that, you need to buy buy licenses. Gotcha. So if somebody has you know a network and they have a couple of core devices, they could throw this in there and have it back those up, get a feel for it, you know, over a couple of months. That's one thing that kind of bugs me about some places is you get, you know, 15 days or 20 days and it's, that's not really, it's not really a good test of a product, especially when it's a backup product where you want to watch subversion or you want to watch changes over time and, and really see it flexibly. So I think it's pretty cool for that too. Gives people a way to kind of ease into it. Um, so I know, at one point, you were talking about making this also sort of a cloud-hosted product. Is that something that's still on the roadmap? Uh, definitely, but only after beta. Uh, so the plan is to release this as a self-hosted solution that you run it inside of your own network. And as soon as that is released, uh, I want to offer it as a cloud solution as well. So you will have a choice. It's completely up to you if you want to deploy it locally or if you just want to run it as a cloud-hosted solution. And again, if it runs as a cloud-hosted solution, of course, <laughs> I don't expect anybody to open up their devices to the, to the cloud, to the web. So you will have a tiny, tiny package which you deploy inside of your network, which is just like a backup proxy or a backup, you know, accessor into your internal network. And that will actually, so the cloud system will through that your internal proxy do all of the backups. And again, this is just, uh, uh, this will be running, of course, in AVS, in Amazon Cloud. So if you want to make absolutely sure that it's always available, that there are no outages, that you don't have to care about hardware, software, high availability or anything, you can just purchase cloud and you're done. Gotcha. I kind of like the idea of being able to, uh, to tell a customer, hey, uh, just go to this website, sign up. And within just a couple of clicks, they're up and running and done, and I don't have to think about it. And then I know I'll always have access to their infrastructure. So if they're having a problem inside, I can pull their config and do whatever I need to do with it, you know, see if they actually change something, and then I can easily, you know, so say they brick their network in such a way that I can't connect anymore. Well, I can pull their most recent backup and say, well, it looks like you guys made these changes, and this could probably be. So I'm just looking at it from a selfish perspective that, this is going to help me out with a lot of different customer sites, I think. Yeah, and again, it's it's up to you what you choose. If if you don't want to have your information in the cloud, then you can deploy it locally. Also, uh, yes, I feel it's very important to mention that while it will be running in the cloud, all of the user information will actually be encrypted. So I won't have any kind of access into the actual user's information, which first of all, I don't want. And second of all, it's, it's of course a huge security issue if they were accessible by a third party. So of course it will be completely client side encrypted and everything else. Gotcha. So when you forget your password, don't ask Thomas. To, no, to there tell is, you what when is. you forget your password, <laughs> of course you have the email recovery system, but if, if that fails, then nope, I, there is no way for me to, to get information. It's encrypted and... But again, as I mentioned, as, as you can imagine, that's an additional workload. So that's uh, probably still a little way off. Yeah. 
I kind of like the idea too. So whenever you're adding new devices, whenever you're doing feature upgrades, I don't have to download those and, and put them on my local server. You're going to automatically do all that for me. Oh, yes, definitely. You yeah. don't have to care about any of that. Yeah. And so like if, I, if I'm running 40 client sites and I'm getting them all to do this, I don't have to reach out to each one and then individually back them up. If I have them all go to your central repository where you're doing all that work for me, it keeps it so much simpler. Cool. That's that's what I'm most excited about is maximum lazy. I know you probably hate me for that, and I always <laughs> want the easy button, but uh, if I can have you, uh, this smart guy over here, doing all the hard work for me, then I can uh, spend my brain, my last couple of brain cells somewhere else where I, I guess I probably need them. All right, so the other the other guys in the peanut gallery, you've been awfully quiet. I know it's probably because I will talk over you given the opportunity, but uh, any questions, any challenges, what do you got? It, uh, I've just been busy on the forum submitting feature requests. <laughs> <laughs> You're that guy. How about you, Tom? I guess I'll just turn off the screen sharing so we actually have something to look at. Yeah, no, I'd like... Um... I think uh, I'd like TP-Link to be added, but that's very similar to iOS. So, um, Although some of the TP-Link switches behave differently when they're backing up, so they'll go, you know, when you're logging into, let's say, SSH, it'll say, oh, you have to go enable, and then some of the switches you have to, and, you know, you put in the password, and then it goes, you're still not actually in enable mode. You have to then go enable admin a second command, which is quite annoying, actually, but... But um, yeah, I'd like to see TP-Link probably be one of those supportive vendors as well. Like uh, we use a lot of the switches. But yeah, no, it's, it looks, I have to say it looks, I'm surprised uh, how simple it is considering uh, how Thomas loves the wireless interface of MicroTik. So I was worried, but it is, no, it's very good. And I don't mean uh, uh, that's no reflection on your ability to have low, but it is actually genuinely uh, quite easy to use, which is, um, it's a, it's a lot more difficult, I think, to make something easy to use than it is a complex, you know, so simplicity um, is something that's very hard to achieve, so well done on it. And uh, I think I'm going to be spinning up a VM fairly shortly, probably after this podcast, and using that key that you kindly sent on to me, so thanks very much for that. And well done on the work, it, it clearly uh, has paid off, and I, I, I can see even the security-conscious customers and some of the consultants that I work with, um, I, I think they'd be very impressed with your uh, security from the ground up approach, as opposed to something you bolt onto a pretty shitty security framework to start. Well done, Tom. Genuinely. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. And to your to your point there, Tom, um, a lot of people can program, but not very many people can make uh, a user interface nice. Uh, and I think you can... Everybody's seen what happens when you let the programmers make the user interface. You know, you've got a million checkboxes and crazy stuff. So um, it's extremely usable, right? You can you can obviously tell on the back end it's functional. It's going to work. Uh, and he's constantly making it more and more reliable and robust. But from the ground up, it looks so simple to use, which is another one of the things. That, so, like, if it's complicated, I can research, I can study. But then everybody else inside is going to have problems. Uh, working with a system right this anybody in my organization can pick up and go with it so it's going to make yeah. it super easy and another thing tom mentioned was the beta is that uh, i know you said open beta is that open to anyone so right now we can shoot people over your direction and they can start signing up so right now it's actually closed beta so you need to sign up yes you can go to unimus.net and then sign up uh, i send out keys regularly so if if you really want the key, just email me and I'll get you a key if uh, that's not a problem. And uh, uh, if you sign up and you haven't received your key yet, then just post on the forums and I will sort you out as well. And hopefully I will open up open beta, I think in about, I, I don't want to be too optimistic, about two months. It, it would be my time frame for, for a open beta and then you know a bit more for release so open beta in two months and then full release in four months i would say that's yes that's very real realistic okay fantastic christmas presents <laughs> what month is this yeah it's july 
Yeah, 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 pretty close. Thanksgiving Day present. Um, Black sorry. Friday, big sale. <laughs> this will be a big rush. All right. Well, that's tremendous, man. I uh, That was such a smooth demo. Uh, you know what they say, like the moms never do it live. And then uh, oh, fuck kid, fuck. kid just did it live right there. Uh, <laughs> he's either brave or crazy. Uh, or maybe just really confident in what he built. Maybe there's that too. Uh, cool. Awesome. Well, what else can we say about it? What else would you like to say about it? Uh, whew, I I think the demonstration already showed everything there is. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let me say something. I think um, everything I've seen Thomas do, he does it 115%. So I have the utmost confidence that this project's just going to go to the moon. Uh, and I think anybody would be crazy not to uh, to jump on it and at least give it a try. Um, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised because 99% of the Wisps I talked to are doing it very manual, very ad hoc. So this is a very quick, simple solution. With this, you have no excuse anymore to not do backups because it's so simple. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tom and Thomas. Amazing products, and appreciate your time, sir. Thank you guys for, for 